Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you, particularly uh, on a rainy day, but uh, everyone's here gathered together for another fantastic chapel. Today we have a special treat. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, some of your fellow students. Every summer we have hundreds of students traveling around the world through our Global Perspectives program, and you're going to be hearing from five of them today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce all five of them up front, and uh, no further introductions will occur. They'll come up in succession. Uh, when they come up, you'll actually see a picture of that particular person on the screen. You'll also see her or his name along with that picture, so you'll know who that is, again, without any further introduction. So here are our five people, and we look forward to having them today. We are blessed uh, that they're going to be with us and sharing. Starting us off is Grayson Russell. Grayson is a sophomore from Clanton, Alabama. He is a digital media major with a specialization in cinema, and he took a trip this summer to New Zealand. Following him is Monica Allison. Monica is a senior from right here in Cleveland. She's a nursing major, and she went on the School of Nursing trip to Kenya. From Gurney, Illinois, our third speaker is senior Jeannie Curian. She is a health science major, and she went on a missions trip to Honduras. Our fourth speaker is Caleb Bunn. He is a senior from Rocky Mount, North Carolina, a biology major with a pre-med emphasis, and he took a trip to Guatemala. And then wrapping things up, uh, another local person is Meredith Cook. Meredith is a junior. She's a PR major, and she went on the trip to South Africa with singers. So once again, leading us off, if you would, please help me welcome to the stage Grayson Russell. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, going to try not to ramble on this guy. So if you look up here, we got to go to New Zealand, um, which is the most consistently beautiful place on the planet. Um, my prep for uh, my cross-cultural trip started about uh, 15 years ago. Um, when I was five, I vividly remember like sitting in my babysitter's um, living room, this like shag carpet kind of deal, watching the two towers, like Lord of the Rings, with a Krispy Kreme donut and a sun-kissed. Um, and <laughs> I was never a Star Wars guy, never a Harry Potter person, um, but Lord of the Rings easily uh, became the biggest secular influence on my life. If you come by my room at Hicks, I have a Afghan, like, with all their faces on it on my bed. It's terrible. Um, so... <laughs> um, let me see. Um, I would pour over stuff, you know, Pete Jackson introducing places like Matamata, Mata, which was Hobbiton, um, which was a dream come true, uh, especially if you were on like the, uh, the Australian New Zealand trip. I know you got to go there as well. Um, the Wakapapa Ski Fields, Mount Ropehu. And um, it's the first time once we landed in Auckland, uh, it's on the north end of the North Island, that um, I realized that God really will give you um, the desires of your heart. Uh, I've been blessed to kind of go off and travel a little bit here and there, um, but New Zealand's the only place I've ever wanted to go. Um, and I didn't realize that until I, I arrived. So, uh, again, I'm a cinema major. Uh, I was sent with uh, Cody Mathis and uh, Jenna Sepp, uh, comm majors, to film an education-based trip. So we're here to film um, these education majors from Lee, wanting to be teachers in the States, um, and we're learning about how you know, the Kiwis and New Zealanders do school. Um, so most of the time they would, like, greet us with this thing called a haka, uh, H-A-K-A, which amounts to, like, a bunch of kids, like, screaming and shouting, like hooping and hollering and chanting is terrifying. Um, literally like they want to eat us, and that's actually some of the stuff they're saying um, in their you know, own you know, Polynesian way. Um, so the first school we go to is like these little elementary kids, so it's cute, you know, you got like five and six year olds like jumping up and hopping and everything else. Um, but we get to the second one in uh, Rotorua, which I, I looked it up, is 8,082 miles from Cleveland. Um, so we're in Rotorua, and we're at this, like, middle school. So with, like, middle schoolers, you have, like, the little, like, scrawny ones, and then you have, like, the you know, knuckle dragon, like, Neanderthals. You know how that kind of, like, works out? So these were all, like, Neanderthals. These kids were huge. Um, these, like, 12 and 13-year-olds. I'm not a big guy, but they were every bit as big as me. Um, so we're walking across this parking lot, and there's 600 kids on the other end just, like, standing, like, just stone-faced at us, like, not saying a word. It's like, okay, this is weird, but, you know, we're going to do it. I got my little GoPro out. They start, like, screaming, and we thought we all were going to get eaten, like, they're stomping and hollering and everything else. So we're all freaking out, but we kind of cool down because, you know, they're not literally going to eat us, hopefully. Um, 
and uh, we're walking through and we're looking through all their facilities and everything. And like any, you know, good God-fearing Lee student, we found the musicians, um, you know, all the instruments within five or ten minutes. Uh, so we're in there like snatching guitars off the wall and everything else, doing everything we can. And we're playing. You got two cinema majors, an exercise science major on the drums, this little Maori kid named Noah. He's playing the bass and their guitar teacher. So we're playing around. We did some prints and everything else. And uh, their teacher begins to introduce us to this kid uh, that he's got who um, was the dude who was leading the haka, like all the screaming stuff earlier. Um, he was as big as me. Um, he's 13. I can't remember the guy's name. He had like long black hair, like all the way down his back, like this big Polynesian kid. Um, and he spoke like, like Froggy from the Little Rascals. He was just like, ah, I whipped out my lizard kind of guy. Um, but in like a British accent, so it was cool. He sounded like a chain smoker. Um, and uh, so, which, I mean, he'd been screaming all morning, you know, God love him in his defense. Um, so the, the teacher begins to introduce us to the kid, and he's like, he's got all these, like, vocal awards for all these talent shows he's won singing or whatever. So we're thinking, oh, cool, we're going to get this, like, one-on-one haka thing with these little kids, and he's going to be leading it, and we're all going to be terrified, and I have no problem running my scrawny butt back on down the hill to the bus. And um, we're all, like, sitting here waiting for it, and dude's like, okay, go to A. So we're in A. And lo and behold, 8,082 miles away, this kid breaks out into the coolest version of Tennessee whiskey I've ever heard in my life. (laughs) So this is like the most bizarre thing in the world because we are 8,000 miles away from home, and this kid's breaking out into Chris Stapleton. Um, You know, the Grammys drop like two and a half hours away. So uh, we're there, and it's one of those moments where you realize that you're never too far away from home. Um, and the world maybe isn't as big as we've all, you know, got it cracked up to be. Um, so wherever your major leads you, um, whether that changes or not, um, the cross-cultural thing will change your life. Um, it's a thing that I would go right back and do again. I know we impacted some lives there with some of those kids. Um, and we had a good time. And we had a good time. So thank you, guys. Well, it's definitely hard to follow Grace in there, but um, this summer I had the amazing opportunity of going to Kenya, Africa for two weeks in May. Um, And this was not a tourist trip, but rather a clinical-based medical missions trip. Um, Our team was led by Dr. Jones. Uh, We partnered with New Frontier Health Force under the direction of Dr. Tanya, who the Maasai tribe call Mama Daktari, and Reverend Linda Brown, who we call Mama Linda. Uh, The six of us threw two flew to Nairobi, the capital, and drove five hours to Naswani, a remote area on a very bumpy road. Um, it felt like we were riding in, in a massage chair. It was really loud and dusty and just like... Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> <laughs> so this was home for us for the next couple weeks. Uh, We soon got accustomed to showering every three days from a five-gallon solar heated bag brushing our teeth with water bottles, and taking care of business, or going to the bathroom, in the latrine, which is just a hole in the ground. Our trip was divided between educational instruction and practical application. Over the next two weeks, we had medical lectures given by Dr. Tanya covering relevant uh, medical issues for third world countries such as malaria, brucellosis, and HIV. I actually had the opportunity to work in a lab um, and do blood tests on the patients that came into the clinic. As I tested a pregnant mama for HIV, I was disheartened to look down at the strip and see that the um, test came back uh, positive. Since this village practices polygamy, uh, this woman, who was one of many sister wives, um, looked at me and desperately explained uh, that if anyone found out, she would be disowned from her family. The previous lecture on HIV suddenly became a reality. One of my favorite days was going to Building Hope Academy and performing school assessments on the little kids. It was so cute to see them flex and to see them uh, bend over and touch their toes as we assessed for muscle tone and uh, scoliosis. They were so confused as we tried to speak their language. It ended up in a big game of medical charades. But when we prayed over them, the medical or the language barrier was totally broken. As you know, many cross-cultural trips, you have to get a series, series of shots. Um, but for our trip, why we were so different is we had to administer over 100 B12 shots to the village. 
Rather than gi giving them in the clinic, we went out uh, to the open air market to give these injections. So technically, we were shooting up in the streets. <laughs> The Maasai women were unbelievably strong and resilient. I witnessed this as while well. they were in labor. Uh, they would walk around um, a long ways, a distance to the clinic uh, to deliver these babies with no epidural, epidural no pain medication, um, and they would be walking out in two hours. Shelby and Taylor actually had um, the opportunity to assist in one of those deliveries. Not all of our activities were medical. When we first arrived, um, we went to a giraffe reserve and an elephant orphanage where a giraffe licked my face and an elephant slapped me in the face with his trunk. <laughs> it caught me off guard. <laughs> we also went to an African safari and uh, we saw zebras, hippos, hyenas, lions, and leopards. We also saw another side of Dr. Jones when our Jeep got stuck in the mud for over an hour. The last story I'd like to share with you guys is one that I'll never forget. One morning, I was walking to the bathroom after sleeping in the mud hut um, for culture day. I look across the compound and I see Dr. Tanya sprinting to the clinic. She spots me and she yells for me to get on my scrubs and to get my stethoscope immediately and get to the clinic as fast as I possibly could. So I get my clothes on, I get my stethoscope, and as I'm sprinting up there, I just have a flashback of um, running track when I used to run freshman and sophomore year here at Lee. I get to the clinic, and not only did I forget to put on socks, but I forgot to put in my contacts. <laughs> um, so I go to the back of the clinic, and I see um, there is a really bad car accident with five victims. Uh, Dr. Tanya tells me to grab a patient, ready when the other girls to come immediately and start doing what I know to do. This is why we pay attention in class. <laughs> I start taking vital signs and assessing his injuries, uh, which I noted lacerations bilaterally on his shins and his mouth was cut open. His body was shaking violently to, due to the uh, decreased temperature and shock. Shortly after, um, Dr. Jones came in to insert an IV. She asked me to hold down this combative patient. Guys, I'm, I'm pretty small. This guy was pretty big, <laughs> so I had to hold him down, um, which was really a challenge. We were able to stabilize all five patients, um, and load them into the ambulance, and send them to the nearest hospital 45 minutes away. We were running on adrenaline for the past two hours, and it was insane. It's amazing to look back at that and think, God had planned us to be in the right place at the right time. Dr. Tanya, she could have done that on her own, but it would have been more difficult for her. And it was amazing to experience that with her. Going on this trip allowed me um, to develop a deeper compassion and understanding for cultures very different than our own. And it was truly transformational. Well, I've always wanted to say this. Thank the Lord for nursing majors, Monica, but seriously, they work so hard. Um, so, Honduras, well, it was one of the most radical summers of my life, probably so far. Um, there's no way I can truly convey to you very well, God's transformative ministry through Lee alum, Dr. Martin and Wendy Williams. To me, they embody Christ's hands and feet through their empowerment of the community's spiritual and physical needs in Honduras. Their beautiful daughter, Rachel Williams, is a good friend of mine. And if you ever get a chance, ask her. Ask her about her story. Ask her about her testimony. And she'll tell you. But because she told me at some point, since freshman year, I had this immense desire to go to Honduras, and financially, it just really never worked out up until the summer, and it was such a blessing. So early this May, I found myself alongside Team Guatemala working 
eight to five every single day, either prepping for understanding Latin American culture, understanding the medications that we're gonna bring through pharmacology, or packing medications. We actually spent two hours every single day packing thousands of dollars worth of medications to take on this trip. And that was fulfilling in itself because in that moment, we were all kind of just sitting and we all realized that this is what we've been studying for for two, three years and finally our passion is gonna meet our studies at Lee and it's gonna mesh and that was so exhilarating to know. And then we get to Honduras and it was crazy because the science majors that I had looked up to throughout my first two years at Lee were there working as staff, interning, and they were being the responsible citizens that Lee calls us to be. They went out on their own and found a place in Honduras and was full-time working there, and it was amazing. It was incredible. Not only that, we had to, we had a lot of doctors come in and they had brought their families and a lot of them were Lee alum and man, Lee is a special place. Um, it was incredible to be there. I had a little bit of a hard time though. I had seen poverty close up. Um, I had been to India, I had been to different orphanages, but I never felt so immersed in my field before and the thing that I was so passionate about with the people that I wanted to help. I was there to help serve others. That was my goal. That was, it was so simple, yet I found myself falling so short because I realized, one, I don't have enough knowledge and two, I don't have enough finances. I mean, if this little bottle right here, this is a little Tylenol bottle. I've kept this in my backpack for the past three years. And never once had I been grateful or thankful for having the luxury of having this bottle. Because while we were in Honduras, they were people, they were moms, moms and babies who had fevers that all they needed was a small bottle of children's Motrin to res reside that fever and they waited for hours in the clinicals that we had set up in different villages. And that broke my heart because my passion is to help children in need and how had I been so ignorant my whole life, even while I was at Lee, that this bottle meant nothing to me. And to make matters worse, through the physical demands, through the emotional demands, the spiritual demands, in between the two weeks I was there, I had a family member who passed away, and um, I had my mom who had called me, and he was like a grandfather to me, and the disease he passed away from was specifically something we had talked about in our pharmacology class. I had known the ins and outs. I had known the pain, and I realized at that moment that I couldn't do anything. There was nothing that I could personally do. And it broke me. I remember it being Saturday night, hearing my mom tell me, and I cried for about two hours out on the porch in the hospital compound, and I was lucky to have one of the most amazing group of people, teams that I've ever worked with, who embraced me so well. I was lucky to have Dr. Brown, who is an incredible man. Incredible man. He made Chem 21, he taught organic here. He is incredible. He wept alongside me. And y'all, that's Lee for you. Where else are you gonna find professors that cry with you? Where else are you gonna find professors that care so deeply about your heart? 
I was so moved because I, who had come to serve, was so far humbled because I couldn't do anything except try to be who God had called me to be in that moment. And that was when the full circle hit me. Service is an outright response to God's love. My professors served me by loving me. My friends served me by seeing my pain. The people of Honduras served me through their smiles. They served me through making baleadas for us when they had, they, that might have been their meal for the day. They served us so well. And that was this trip for me. I needed to understand what service is and what God's love truly is. And so I am telling you guys, enjoy your Lee experience. Love so deeply. Love the people around you. And that's how you will serve them. All right. So I went to Guatemala this summer with the science department's medical mission trip. It was the counter counterpart to what Jeannie just talked about. I think up there on the picture, there's a, one of the days we were in clinic. Um, that little boy had just gotten six of his teeth pulled out, so he was kind of kind of upset. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, the basic idea behind what we did, I think the Honduras team is at like a, the same location, but we um, move around and set up different clinics in, around uh, Weiwei, Tenango, Guatemala. Um, and give treatment for free to individuals that need it. Um, we had some very interesting experiences. I think one of the first ones came just about the second night we were there at 1.30 in the morning. I was awoken by what I thought was the Lord's return, but it turned out to be just a, just a horrible earthquake that was shaking um, just everything. And um, here in Tennessee, and I'm from North Carolina, we just don't have earthquakes at all like that, so that was horrifying. But so my, my roommate was one of the doctors, and he goes, congratulations, you're experiencing your first earthquake. And I was like, awesome, thank you. Um, so he fell back asleep. I didn't for a long time. But yeah, that was um, among the first. We had also had another earthquake, you know, if it couldn't get better, and then a landslide. And then the river in front of our, like the place we stayed, just jumped course and like flooded the streets. In front. So it was crazy. But it was, it was truly an amazing experience, but um, so on a more serious note, I mean, earthquakes are serious, but on a more spiritually significant note, um, <laughs> I think it's easy when we go to serve uh, to take this um, mindset with us that they're poor, we're not, so we should feel bad because we have much and they have little and we should pity them. I think that's kind of an easy mindset to have. It's not necessary. Uh, not everybody takes that to be derogatory, but it's like, it, it just kind of, that's it because we are privileged and they are have, they're impoverished. Um, so some people have this like shock factor to the poverty when we get down there. And I, you shouldn't have to go to Guatemala to know what poverty looks like, first of all. You can walk a mile down the street that way and you can see poverty. So. I wasn't shocked by the poverty. I was shocked by the joy of the Lord in these people. I was shocked by how strong their faith was despite their circumstances. It literally blew me away. Um, like Jeannie was saying with the Tylenol, people came in and just needed a bag of Tylenol that we had. And that was an answer to their prayers. Um, and that just blows my mind that like on a, on a horrible week during the semester, I question God's goodness because I have three exams and a paper, and I'm just like, why God, why me? And, <laughs> and we get down there, and these people come in smiling, and they say, bless you, God bless you for what you're doing for me. And I'm like, well, that is humbling. I'm like, God blessed me through them. 
God blessed me through them, through their smiling faces, through this little baby that I got to hold and she fell asleep on me, through the fact that I got to I got to speak at their church, at the church they were working with, and share my testimony, and they were grateful that I shared. Um, gosh, their, their faith makes ours, mine specifically, I can't speak for everyone, but mine look like a mustard seed. Their faith is, their faith truly could move mountains. Um, I specifically remember this one instance that I've like just not been able to forget. It wasn't even in clinic, but I went to this, um, we were in like a, it was like a free day and we were touring a city and they had this Catholic church and it wasn't in session or I don't know, it's called mass or whatever, but um, we, we, I went in and I kind of slid into one of the pews and just listened. Um, and this lady took her child up to the altar and she was speaking Spanish, but we, I knew enough by that time to figure out what she was saying, but she was like crying out to God for her family and for her child, just holding her child out in front of the altar. Like, God, please, you know, be with my child, heal my child, heal my family with such expectation that God was going to come through. And I don't know. I don't know that I pray like that. I don't know that I pray and expect God to do anything. I think I pray because I pray. And by the world standards, she's poor and I'm rich. In this life, she is poor and I am privileged. But eternally, she is far, far richer than I am. And that's, that's what I took with me, that there is good there. Um, there's light and there's hope. And it's, it's in this group of people that we consider to be poor. But gosh, they, they really are rich. And we can have compassion for them in their circumstances, but there's something to be learned from people who who, who just reflect God's faithfulness in suffering. Thank you. I will never forget the moment I realized that my passport was gone. I will never forget the moment I sat in the back of a car sobbing after searching for hours and realizing it was definitely lost. I will never forget the moment I felt like I had failed so many people and ruined my trip. I will never forget the moment I decided to wait an hour to call my dad because I was so afraid he'd be mad at me. But when he arrived to help us look, he just hugged me and let me cry. Ugly cry. I will never forget all of the people who helped me look for my passport. I will never forget having to take my new passport picture with puffy eyes due to 24 hours of crying and no makeup. I will never forget holding my new passport in my hands. Unbelievable. That's the best word I can think of to describe my first 24 hours of my trip to South Africa. It was time to get on the bus with the Lee Singers and begin the trip of a lifetime, but little did I know my trip would be delayed. I had placed my purse on top of our family car gotten sidetracked, and absentmindedly boarded the bus. My mom drove off, and my purse went with her. Minutes later, a woman in the car next to my mom rolled down her window and yelled, you dropped your purse back there. Immediately, my mom turned the car around, but my little brown purse was gone. My money was gone, my passport was gone, and my trip to South Africa, gone. Many of my friends and family came to help me search all over Cleveland for hours but we had no luck. I remember feeling so hopeless. I remember all of my friends and family gathering around, holding hands on the street where the purse was lost and praying that somehow I would still get to go. In those moments, which felt like a lifetime, all I wanted to do was cry. I could not understand why this was happening to me. I could not understand why I was the one that lost my passport and couldn't go to South Africa with the Lee Singers. Well, with a lot of help, and a lot of grace, I got an expedited passport the next day and boarded my first ever flight alone for 15 hours. The next stop, Johannesburg, South Africa. My actual trip was full of indescribable moments. The moment we stepped into the hospital of the Bellini compound in Zambia, I was blown away by the lack of medical supplies they had. There were no hospital beds, no ambulances, no sanitary cleaning supplies, or even clean floors. I expected Africa to be rough, but it doesn't seem real until you witness it. 
My heart breaks for the mother who is holding her dying son, the man who is screaming in pain and holding his leg in the back of a pickup truck, the child who has never experienced a life without sickness. All of these images are examples of actual people I witnessed at the hospital that day. Hopelessness is the word that comes to mind when describing that hospital and the feelings which consume the eyes of every person there. Getting to sing to them about God's love, mercy, and healing was bittersweet. It was incredible getting to encourage them through music, but was God really there? Of course he was. It was evident that these were truly his people, but it was difficult to sing about healing when healing was not there. It was difficult to sing about joy when joy was not there. God's love, however, consumed that tiny, dirt-floored hospital room in ways I had never witnessed. His people worshiped and believed, and in that moment, so did I. After the hospital visit, we had the opportunity to sing in the streets where tons of children ran up to us. One little girl seemed as though she wanted to give me a high five, but then her sweet little hand clasped mine and her fingers began to curl around mine, and she just held it there. She was amazed with my skin and just seeing our hands intertwined. And in this moment, I realized we were one and the same. Although every single thing about us seemed different, we were alike. This seemingly simple moment is when I began to understand the people of Balini. I saw that all they wanted was love. They didn't want pity. They wanted to see love, God's love, and simply the love of others. That was the moment I will never forget. My favorite part of the day was getting to spend time with the people of Balini in their church. Getting to see them worship, learn their native songs and dances, and even hear them pray was an experience like no other. I was amazed that when they prayed, they didn't ask God for things. They weren't asking for more water, clean toilets, more food, or clean clothes. Instead, they were praising him relentlessly. They were thanking him for everything that he does for them and crying out that he is holy. I've never felt more humble than in that moment. I realized that I have everything and they have nothing. Yet they are the ones thanking God, and I am constantly asking for more. In this moment, I realized I worship the same God that the people of Bolini do. I cry out to the same God as the people of Bolini. I am saved by the same God as the people of Bolini. And in this life-changing moment, I understood God in a way I never had before. I can imagine him crying for his children who were hurting, rejoicing for those who had overcome a trial, and even his heartbreaking for what breaks mine. In this moment, the people of Balini reminded me how to trust God. They reminded me that he has a plan for my life and his love is unconditional. I don't believe I would understand God in the way I do now if I hadn't met the people of Balini. This day, these moments, they were humbling. And that's the best way I know to describe the beauty of Balini. I'm so thankful that a lost passport did not keep me from experiencing all of these moments with the Lee Singers. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. You've had some wonderful trips and uh, Global Perspectives Office. Go visit them and get to know them. Start planning your trip now. This is one of the most phenomenal experiences that you can have as a Lee University student, so get involved. Amen. A uh, couple things coming up. Tuesday in chapel, Dr. Khan will be in here, and the School of Religion will be in the uh, Dixon Center. Also, because of the weather, no soccer matches tonight, but on Sunday at 1.30, the women's soccer will play uh, Rollins College. And on Sunday at 4, men's soccer will play against Treveca. Also, coming up Friday night, tomorrow night, ServeCast Live featuring Dr. Terry Cross discussing the church in the world. It'll be in the Dixon Center. And if you are one of the first 500 students, free Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Can I hear an amen? amen? All right. Stand with me, please. Thank you. Thank you for being faithful to chapel. 
Uh, we enjoy seeing you, and this is an important part of our life together, our community here at Lee University, participating in chapel together. Would you join me in saying our college benediction? And if you need that, it's on the screen there for you. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you.